I'm an underdog. I live in a town of 10,000 people. I got comfortable being uncomfortable. Don't go to Timbuktu and buy a market there because that's likely going to be hard to unload if it doesn't work. Left me in this place of being able to design my life again of how I want it to look. Welcome to the Zero to Profitable Franchise Podcast, the best place for you to come to figure out the right franchise to buy and how to get and stay profitable. My name is Tark Johnson, and I've bought, grown, and sold multiple franchises and got myself free from corporate America, and now I'm on a mission to help you do that too. Here you'll find some of the most in-depth, profitable franchise secrets, tangible strategies, and specific mindsets to help you create your dream life through franchising. So I got to flip the script and chat with Eric Van Horn of Franchise Secrets. Now this episode is a treat and a masterclass in what is possible franchising. Eric's known in almost every circle in the franchise community, and we sat down and talked about how he got his start in franchising with Liberty Tax when he was in his 20s. This is a crazy story because he was pretty much broke right before he bought into that franchise. He wound up becoming a master franchisee, which we'll talk about what that is, and then he sold all of his rights back to the franchisor. And then over the next coming years, he wound up owning over six franchise brands in multiple states, becoming a franchisor, and the man behind the Franchise Secrets community. He now lives on an 80-acre ranch in South Dakota, living his dream life with his wife and three daughters. So this is a rare moment to get to hear the man behind the Franchise Secrets podcast, where I flip the script, and he's the one answering the questions and sharing his story, not asking the questions. Now, this is a story that will inspire you to think bigger, because I know that I certainly did after this conversation. Now, this episode is not sponsored by anyone, If you're wanting to buy a franchise in the next 12 months or less, then you should check out my free franchise masterclass at buyaprofitablefranchise.com. And if you want to work with me or my team on help finding or buying a franchise or resale business, then you can go to tarkjohnson.com slash consulting, and we're happy to see if we can help. With that said, let's jump into episode number four of the Zero to Profitable Franchise podcast. Awesome. Welcome, everyone. I'm here with uh, Eric Van Horn, the man, the myth, and the legend. Uh, Eric is uh, the uh, the founder of Franchise Secrets, which has just been an epic community. I'm, I'm, I'm a huge admirer of all the things that you've done. But uh, Eric, thanks for hopping on and uh, and welcome. Dude, it's great to be here, Tark. I've been uh, following you for a while and watching all your content, and I love it. Yeah, sweet, man. Well, cool. So, you know, I really, I really want this conversation. There's so many different ways that we can take this because you are like the Swiss army knife of franchising. At least that's what it, that it feels like you are, you are everywhere and with everyone. Um, And you, you know, you, you do a lot of different things. Why don't you just spend, spend a second, just tell everyone a little bit about yourself, kind of the 30 to 60 second version, and then we'll kind of dive into how you got involved in this world. Sounds good. So I started my first franchise in my mid twenties and it was Liberty tax service. And I bought an area development at the same time. I spent nine years in that brand. And then I went into consulting and started six other brands as a franchisee or area developer or area rep. And then I've uh, done a lot of helping brands grow over the last 20 years in terms of franchise development, helping uh, working for franchisors, uh, becoming a franchisor myself and um, exiting that and exiting a lot of the different franchise brands that I've been a part of and uh, started a podcast a number of years ago. And uh, that really kind of uh, put me out there in the public eye. And uh, since then, there's just uh, all kinds of opportunities, so many things to go to, to do um, once you have kind of that personal brand built, as you know. Uh, so that is uh, that's a quick like 60 second version of who I am. I live in the Black Hills in South Dakota on an 80 acre hobby ranch out here with my wife and three daughters who are eight, nine and 11. And uh, that's me. That's awesome, man. You know, it just popped into my head, which is um, I had this thing in my studio, which we're not doing this in today because of the guys sawing outside. <laughs> but uh, I had this thing that says uh, Dream Life Mastery. That's actually the name of my entity. And what just popped in my head is, you know, from the outside looking in, 
like you were living the dream life. I mean, you have this amazing 80 acre ranch. You're, you're constantly posting pictures about what you're doing with your family, what you're teaching them and have so many business interests and things going on. So what's it, what does it feel like now? You know, as I imagine that was once a dream that you imagined for yourself, what does it feel like to actually be living it now? Do you pinch yourself some days thinking like, wow, I, I did it. Yeah. When I'm driving home. So my dream life is not what everybody's dream life is. I'll have people come out here and they're like, this is awesome where you live and blah, 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 but they can't wait to get back to the city. So this is definitely my, my dream life. And I do, I, you know, I'll, I think it often and half, uh, you know, probably once or twice a week driving home, um, kind of in the, in the fields, like I'm on a gravel road. <laughs> and then I look at our house that's nestled up against a uh, national forest service to so kind of the, the main, uh, like mountain in, in the town. And it's all, it's just beautiful. It's like nestled right up against that. And I do pinch myself. I'm like, I can't believe that we live here and we have the life that we do. We have the family that we have, but with all that said, there's definitely challenges and, and it's been easy, also easy for me to kind of stray away from that and want to get back in the hustle of grind of things. Um, so even though I have that, I still get discontent at different times and wanting to build because build it because we as entrepreneurs are always kind of driven to build and um and I want to build more with my family and focus on that and um and I want and I am I'm developing that and I'm actually just a real quick plug for a group that I'm a part of called Front Row Dads uh John Roman started that and the premise or the 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 thing that they say is we are family men with businesses not businessmen with families and so uh, once I got involved in that community, it really helped stabilize or ground me into that being the real focus. But even with that said, it's still easy for me to want to do more, to be in the office more, to work more and tell them around people that they are not just driven by money or just driven to build something big. They're driven for different things or more than that. Yeah. You know, that's a, that's a very profound point. And, um, you know, I think it's a great segue into, you know, a lot of people that want to get into franchising, they, they want to get into it because they want to spend more time with their family and, you know, they want to have more freedom and, and flexibility, but let's talk about how you got started. So, to, how did how did you get introduced to franchising and what were you doing before that? So I had uh, started, uh, I took my LSAT, got accepted to law school, and I was a straight C student. So I don't know how I passed the LSAT and I don't know how I got accepted to law school. And then I, but I realized as a straight C student going to law school, that was going to be a painful time for me. So I, I uh, was like, I was going to orientation and I, and I just stopped. I just quit before I actually started my first class. And then I started to, I bought my first house, which was a duplex. So I lived in half of it. And then I rented the other half to a tenant so I could live in the house for free. And then I was started to get my real estate license so I could sell real estate, become a real estate investor. And I was also starting a little landscaping company at the same time. And when I say a landscaping company, it was me, some shovels, some rakes, a lawnmower, <laughs> things like that. So it was not a real company. It was me out there hustling and trying to get work to be able to pay for the bills. And I was uh, working on this house for this lady and it was a hot day. She came out with some water lemonade and she said, basically said, here's some, here's some water for you, Eric. And what do you want to do when you grow up? And I said, I want to be a real estate investor. She said, well, we did that 20 years ago. And so we like being real estate investors. And I started to have a conversation with her and she said, right now, we just want to sell this property that we've owned for 20 years down by the beach. Now, not a beachfront property, but a condo uh, about a half a mile from the beach. And I said, how much do you want for it? And this is the thing that kind of changed my life. She said, we don't want anything for it. We want someone to take it off of our hands, to buy it from us where we don't pay any closing costs and you can have it. So my mind starts ticking. She paid 20 years on this mortgage. She bought it 20 years ago and the prices were less back then. So I said, let me see your mortgage statement. 
and it said assumable mortgage on it. So I knew that I could just assume that mortgage and, and I didn't have any money though. So I called up my parents. I said, Hey, I found this deal. Do you want to invest in this deal with me? And they're like, this sounds too good to be true. So I went to Gary, my real estate, uh, future real estate broker. And I said, uh, you know, do you want to invest in this deal? He's like, Eric, if your parents don't do this, I'll absolutely do this. And so anyway, we ended up buying that house with my parents, 50-50 partnership where they paid the closing costs of like $6,000. And then I sold the house to them. And that's where I got my first large chunk of money. I mean, that was more money than I'd ever made in my entire life put together, which was still wasn't a lot, but it was enough for me to take that money and buy my first franchise. And so you'll get a kick out of this. So in Virginia Beach, you know, have a bunch of money in the bank or a bunch to me at that time. And some of my friends were looking at a business opportunity and they went to this thing where they said, hey, come meet these guys or founded this franchise. And I went to this meeting and I'm like, wow, this is really cool. Lots of free food, lots of excitement. Um, this is really interesting. Looking back, that was the annual convention of Liberty Tax. So it was like their big <laughs> celebration. I went to their annual convention. And looking back, of course, they wanted me to go because you get excited when you're at an annual convention of a franchise. So uh, so anyway, I ended up buying a, a location, a few locations in Kansas City, Missouri, uh, because everything was sold out in the Virginia Beach market. And I did well my first tax season and I partnered with my parents on that. And then we bought an area development in Austin, Texas, which uh, like a master franchise or area rep. So we took that location when, uh, in Austin when it had four locations, four tax offices, and then we grew it to 42 locations within an eight or nine year period and then sold that back to the parent company. And that was my first eight, nine years in franchising. And, uh, and that's also my first large exit as a franchisee or area rep. And it was a really good one. And that really fueled everything uh, that I did after that point. Wow. Okay. So there's so much to unpack here. What, a, what an epic story. The real estate story is crazy. I'm not even going to dive in more, but that's a crazy story. We'll have to talk about that more offline. Um, I want to I wanna talk about going from taking your LSATs to then showing up and going, okay, I'm not doing this. Like knowing, knowing you, we've had a couple of conversations. We don't know each other at a too deep of a level, but like you're an achiever, like you're a guy that goes out there and wants to make things happen. So what was that like mentally and emotionally to have had this goal in your mind that you were working towards and then like, nah, I'm out. I'm going to quit. Like, did you feel mixed emotions about that? How did you handle making that decision? You know, you're right. Because um, as I reflect back, as you asked that great question, I, I had spent a while like you, you study for the LSAT and then you take it and then you're getting accepted to law schools. And, and at that point I was thinking, you know, I'm, I would be, I'll be an attorney. So in my mind, you're already living in the future. You're already four years past that, four years past law school. And I thought I'll, I'll have, you know, JD next to my name. And then I'll have, I'll be working uh, as an attorney and people really respect attorneys. And then as I started to talk to some of my mentors, as I started to understand really what life after law school looks like, it's a lot of work. They, and you don't get paid a lot of money and you're working all the time. And so I just reflected back on why I wanted to do that and why I, what I wanted to do when I grew up anyway was to be an entrepreneur. So those things were conflicting, going to law school, which really wasn't going to be fun for me, and then doing the work to eventually become a partner to get a high hourly rate that just was not looking like that's what I wanted to do. So, and then I had was reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad at the time. And so a lot of those scenes were conflicting with the outcome of being an attorney. Looking back, I'm so glad I didn't go the attorney route. Now, the best attorneys that I know are either I hire them or they say they're recovering attorneys and they're entrepreneurs. Uh, so I'm really glad I didn't go that route. But back to your question, it really, it really didn't, it, I'm an underdog. I live in a town of 10,000 people. So whenever I go somewhere and they're like, you're from South Dakota, 
they, 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 you know, at least this was my perception. They think differently of you. If you say you're from San Diego or you're from Austin, you know, then like, oh, cool. That's really awesome that you're from, from those areas. But being from South Dakota, there's not a whole lot of great entrepreneurs or, you know, great stuff that comes out of South Dakota. And I got really comfortable with that. I got comfortable being an underdog. I got comfortable being someone that, um, that I didn't have to be, uh, I didn't have to do something for somebody else's approval. Um, and so as I look back and I've never been asked that question. So that's why I said it was a really good question. Um, I'm sure it was a little bit of a blow at that time because I've been telling everybody I'm doing law school, I'm going to do this. And then I'm like, I'm out. But I, I just remember, like, I don't remember a whole lot of that. I remember getting business cards made, putting mowers in the back of my truck, and going to the most expensive neighborhoods with door hangers and just doing that while my friends were going to law school classes. So here I was, they were going to law school classes thinking they're going to, and getting prestigious jobs, or that at least it's, pre- it's a prestigious degree to get. And I'm out there in shorts, boots, and a t-shirt passing out uh, coupons and flyers and handing out business cards in the most expensive of neighborhoods. And so there really was, I'm sure there was some of that, like, what am I really doing? And I'm settling for this. So, you know, I haven't thought about it since then. So really good question. <laughs> um, but since then, like I'm, I embrace the underdog. Like I used to be afraid to tell people I'm from South Dakota and now that's who I am. And I started to realize that's how people remember me. Like I'm the first guy from South Dakota. Most of the people meet when I'm out doing all these cool events and meeting really, really great people. And they remember me because I'm from South Dakota. They remember me because I'm a franchise guy in a marketing world, or I'm a franchise guy in a real estate investing world. So I've, I've, uh, over the years, I've become, uh, very comfortable embracing that. Mm, yeah, that's a interesting, really interesting point. And so, I'm curious to unpack that that kind of transition a little bit more. <clears throat> when I think about my background's financial planning, I've had my investment licenses for 14 years, and actually, uh, my licenses are going to expire in like a week, and uh, which is a big deal because I have four licenses that are incredibly hard test, and I'm letting them expire because if you know that kind of phrase, if you want to take the island, burn the boats. Um, and so it's been two years now since I, I, I haven't been with the firm. But anyways, that's not the point. I think about my first, you know, it, the franchise journey for me and having had periods of working in the store, being used to sitting there in a suit and cufflinks and, you know, custom suits and talking about people investing, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars and in deals. And then all of a sudden I'm like washing dishes or mopping the floor. And for me, there was it. I want to talk about the balance of like the ego and like pride, but like taking pride in like, Hey, I'm building something. So, because I, I think that there's a lot of people that, that are out there that in order for them to make their dreams happen in business ownership, they're likely going to have to take a step backward materially or in they have to get back to being kind of at the bottom again to work their way up. So when you were making that transition and you're used to, okay, I'm taking my LSATs and envisioning yourself as an attorney, and now you're strapping up, putting boots on, mowing lawns, did your pride and ego take a hit or were you, did you feel more excited because you were like, I'm building something that's mine? Well, I would say it's probably both. So it got worse from there. The business that I bought wasn't a cool, awesome, sexy business. It was the tax business. And it was with the tax company that had street sign waivers, street sign spinners, and people dressed as Statue of Liberty or Uncle Sam on the street that were usually homeless. And they had a job during the tax season working for us. And how do you train them? But you get in the suit and the Uncle Sam suit or the Lady Liberty costume, and you're out there teaching them how to do it. So So you did that? 100% I did it. 100% I did it. And not only would I do it just on the street, when you go to businesses, you would dress up like that. So they would remember you and you give them coupons and you would take them donuts. And that was the culture of that company. The culture of the company was 
owners do this, managers do this. And if you can't do this as a manager, then you're probably a weak owner. Or if you can't do it as an owner, you're probably a weak owner. Why are you going to ask them to do something that you won't do yourself? And then as bootstrap uh, early uh, young franchisee, I'm like, I don't have a bunch of people that are going to go do this for me. So I need to go out with my crew and do it myself. And they were always saying, um, marketing is how you get customers in the door. So you don't have a business if you're not out there marketing. And I'm a marketing guy. I'm a sales and marketing guy. So I was out there and that was the best use of my time because I had a good uh, um, operations manager that could oversee the tax office and I didn't know taxes. So I was never going to do a tax return. So I was always focused on marketing to drive customers in the door. But, uh, you know, you would get the looks, you would get like, what are you doing? You're an idiot. And, you know, for nine years, I did that. Even when I was making a lot of money, I would still do that at different times. But at that point, you get to the point where, um, I, so I'll back up a little bit, you know, when you're inside a franchise organization selling for that company on, in franchise development, you get to see all the applications that came in. And so I got to see very high net worth individuals, tens and millions of dollars of net worth at that time. And I thought that was a lot of money at that time. And it still is a lot of money, but that was a lot of money to me at that time. And I saw how their balance sheets looked. I saw how little debt they had and how much of a net worth they had. They had good debt and high net worth and cash to be able to deploy. So I started to have a lot of respect for people that had balance sheets like that versus people that were making a million dollars a year buried in debt and they couldn't even afford a franchise that I could afford. So I started to see real clearly um, the different types of people that were buying these franchises or wanted to buy franchises. Some people couldn't, couldn't make the transition because they were high wage earners with no net worth. And then I saw these other ones that were, were high net worth entrepreneurs. And I saw them out there in the costume doing these different things. And like, if they can do it, I want to be more like them. And so it got, I got comfortable doing that. I got comfortable being uncomfortable. And I've told a lot of people now, when I go to these high-end meetings where I get to meet all famous people and really cool people, um, it makes me uncomfortable at different times. But I got comfortable being, being uncomfortable early in the early days, mowing lawns, dressing up as the Statue of Liberty, having my employees as homeless people that I really grew to care about. And that was my, that was my life. Now my life is talking to really awesome people that have done extraordinary things in business. And it makes me uncomfortable being around them, but I enjoy it because all of those experiences made me a better person, made me who I am today. Mm, that that's uh, the concept of uncomfortable, comfortable being uncomfortable. So powerful. It's so it rolls off the tongue so easy, but to actually live it is is so challenging. And I'm I'm speaking from experience here. So you make this real estate deal happen. You've got a bunch of money in the bank, and you're like, wow, this is awesome. You go to this franchise conference, and now they're probably asking you for not a small sum of money that you just made. What goes through your head at that point? Were you like I'm, were you sold on the dream and you were instantly in, or were you like, holy crap, like this is a lot of money. I could like, this could be a total flop. How did you deal with making that decision? I just put all the chips on the table. Like this, I, I had this money. I never felt like I had that money. Like I never felt, and it wasn't a huge sum of money, but it was still, you know, a good chunk, but I, I never like, felt like I had a lot of money at that point because I, I, in my mind, I was already a business owner and that's what it took to be a business owner. So I never thought about buying a different car. I never thought about buying anything cool. I just went, I just took that and rolled it into the business. And um, so I, I was all in and I was young. I didn't really have anything to lose. And so, and I knew I had hustle. I grew up in an entrepreneurial family and, and I've always worked. I've, I worked construction with my mom and dad's company ever since I can remember, like 12 years old. I was working all the time, hard, hard work. And so I knew I could always fall back on just my hustle. And that's why it was easy for me to start a lawn company. All I have to do is go get business and I put in the work and I'll, I'll be able to make money. So like, this is a, this is a franchise where the founder had already done a franchise before. There was a lot of young people in it. And so I was just, it was e an easy decision for me to make. And I was all in. Mm. You know, I think it's easy for people from the outside looking in, right? Someone might look at you and 
and have their own perceptions about what it takes or what it actually took. And what I'm hearing is like at the fabric of your DNA, like the one thing you do is you can work and put in the work and put in the effort. I know that in the various roles you've been in the franchise world, you've worked with hundreds, if not a thousand people that were transitioning from employee to entrepreneur. And oftentimes you hear people going, well, you know, my ideal situation is I want to be a semi-absentee owner and, you know, I want to do this and this and this and this. Like, what, what do you say to that? What's your perspective on that? Because it's, it's possible, right? But usually you have, to, you have to work pretty hard for a while. What do you say to that for someone man, that that's their goal? Man, that's a good question because, you know, as you say that, I, I did put in the work and I still will put in the work when I need to. I'm more known now for the four-hour work week and, and getting partners and not putting in all the work because I've, I've earned that in ways. Um, so, um, I, yeah, I, I'm not afraid to put in the work. I know what it takes. And then you get people that come and they're like, Hey, I want to buy a franchise. How many hours do you want to work a week? 20 hours. How many, uh, you know, I've, you've got a full-time job and you know, they, they, they just want, or they want to work 10 hours a week. They want to be me. They want to be, they want to be me. And yet they don't want to put in the work necessary to be me. And so I'm, I'm very upfront with folks like that. Like you need to find an operation operational partner if you want to do that, or you need to be able to put things to the side, whether it's family, whether it's fun, whether it's vacations and all these other things to put in the hustle, to put in the work, to be able to make this dream a reality. Because if you don't, then uh, you know it's probably not going to work. And here's the thing that I've seen over the years, and I've made mis- a lot of mistakes in franchising and entrepreneurship. People um, want to get in and they want to do it without the work. They want, they, wanna, they want the dream, but they don't want to put in what's necessary. And because they see other people doing it. And the other problem is franchise or sell the dream. Not all of them do that, but you know, they're selling a dream that's not really reality. And some of them are underselling it. Like they're great opportunities, but um, but they're really careful on who they want. And they want people that will um they want six franchisee success more than anything. So they're very clear on that. You need to put in 30, you can. It can be semi-absentee, but this is what it's going to take. It's going to take an extra $100,000 a year to be able to hire somebody. And it's going to take an extra three years to get to where you want to go financially, but that's how you do it. And I think a lot of people, I just, I'm very upfront with them. Um, if a franchisor does not have franchisees that are doing what you want to do, that are semi-absentee, that came from a corporate background, they didn't, they didn't know how to do it before, then validate with them, learn from them how they did it. But if a franchisor is telling you, yes, we're semi-absentee, but they have no proof of it, then, then buyer beware. You might be the first one and that might be great, but don't assume that you're going to be able to do it. Um, so I get frustrated sometimes with a lot of semi-absentee concepts out there, um, because they're truly not semi-absentee, but I also know there's some great semi-absentee concepts out there that work great having the right partner that you can, that can run the business or the right, uh, employee that can run the business. And I'm starting to see a lot of different, uh, uh, ownership, uh, structures out there that are more designed for true semi-absentee ownership, where investors, there's more of an investor, they're investing money into the brand or the franchisee, and they're getting a, and the investors get in return on that investment. It's more like a loan to the company or the entrepreneur. The loan gets paid back out of cash flow. The entrepreneur then owns 30, 40, 50% of that business themselves, or 80% of the business themselves, however the structure is wor- worked out. But now the owner of that business uh, is now it's their business, and they're not just a partner. They're not just a a, a glorified uh, district operational manager. They are the actual owner of the business. The investor gets all their money back, and then gets you know maybe the investor gets thirty percent or forty percent on the back end of that business while somebody else runs it. So I'm starting to see that structure a little bit more. But here's the net net of that. In order for anybody to have a, if I'm betting on a franchise and that it will be semi absentee. It needs to have the. It needs to be the right brand in the right market, and the right operator. Whether you are the you as the owner are the operator, or you hire that operational person or partner with that operational person, that is 
absolutely key. And I've made mistakes on that in the past where I've hired the wrong person, partnered with the wrong person that was not that operational uh, driven partner. And so, you know, net net at the end of the day, you need to have the right operational person in that business to make any business work, semi-absentee or full-time owner operator. Yeah, that's that's such a that's such a valid point. And so you were talking about how with Liberty Tax, the where you were living, Virginia Beach, like that area was not available, right? At the at right. the time. And so you went and bought Missouri, an area in Missouri? Kansas City, Missouri, yep. Kansas City. And then did you say te- Texas? Where where else was it? So then we had, yep, Austin, Texas. So we so, sold our stuff in Austin and then, I mean, in Kansas City and opened in Austin. So which is, which is kind of crazy to think about. And you're not the first uh, successful kind of empire builder in the franchise world that I've heard this where it was a very, it went being a pretty prolific concept in to get in, they bought a territory that was like nowhere near them. So how did you, how did you manage that? And would, would you advise someone to do that? That's excited about a concept that's validated the concept that knows that it works. They have the resources, but nowhere near them is available. And the only way they get in is somewhere far away. And how did you, how did you manage that from a tactical and strategic standpoint? So, um, the advice is in general, it's probably not recommended, but it, it can work for the right, for the right, uh, person in the right market. Cause, um, you know, if I'm looking at a business and there's a mark, it, a lot of the stuff is market driven. Like there's great franchises out there, but certain markets crush it and certain markets are not very good. So I'm a big believer in even if the franchisor says all markets are equal, I don't think all markets are equal. They might Such be, but my, yeah, but my, in my mind, I'm thinking all markets aren't equal. So I'm wanting to understand what's unique about these markets, that, these people that are absolutely crushing it. A lot of time, it is the owner. The owner will uh, will make the biggest difference. You can have an average owner and put them in a great market or a poor market, and and they're either going to do great or they're going to do poor. You can put a great operator in a poor market, and they'll do average. But I want to find the great markets, low hanging fruit, where business is just easy to be done. So, especially if I'm going out of state, right? So uh, I always look for uh, an incredible market. I also hear something else. That a little uh, nugget of uh, nugget for the listeners. If you're going to go into a market that is out of state or out of your out of your region, make sure it's a really good franchise friendly market. Meaning it's usually the one of the first markets to go in any franchise brand. And the reason is is because you can sell it if it's a hot market in general. Don't go to Timbuktu and buy a market there because that's likely going to be hard to unload if it doesn't work. Or if you want to exit at some point, it's going to be harder to do versus a really hot market. Like Denver's a hot market. Denver's always been a great market for franchising in general. So those are some things that that I would always, always recommend. And then two different models. You've got the franchise model and the area development model. So under the area development or area rep model, is a different than just being a franchisee. And as an area rep, you're buying a region. So we bought Austin, Texas. We bought like up to 60 territories there. And we bought it when it had four locations. So our we paid a lot of money for it. And we, we bought it. And our goal was to sell franchises there, support franchisees there, and then to collect half of the royalties. And so that's what we did. So we sold franchises, we got them up and open, we supported them, and we were collecting half of the royalties. And so it was a really good model. And so you don't have to be day-to-day in the business under area rep models. And so that's more uh, conducive to having out of state versus just a brick and mortar or a, or a location that requires your attention. So that's one thing that I would say area rep models are easier to have out of state and maybe multiple states. Um, going back to, um, I'll talk about Sola Salon Studios and a home care business. We had as an area rep, I had both of the, and Amazing Lash Studios, I had that uh, area rep. All of those were in Southern California. I live in South Dakota. Those were and Southern was, California. And this was after Liberty Tax, after, after Liberty Tax. Yep. Okay. After I 
after I understood how to do this and how to be an app, a, a semi-absentee owner and run businesses remotely, the key is for me, what I, here's the things that I look for. I look for having a good partner that was local. And both of the, in all of those situations, I had an owner, an equal owner that was local to Southern California where we owned that stuff. So um, you're, the, what, you, what you were saying, which was find an operating partner. Right. Yep, find an operating partner. And these were not necessarily operating partners. These were actual general partners with, with me, but Got they it. lived locally. So in other words, it's like me living there, you know, like, so I wasn't truly, it wasn't like me owning in another state. It was a, a, a ownership group and one or two of the owners lived locally. So that was really important. As I've reflected back on all these businesses that I've owned, that was an important piece. And if that was part of my investing in franchise criteria, I probably would have saved some money already. So having a partner that is local um, is a big deal because then they can anytime swing by the business to see what's really going on. Emergency happens, they can be there. They can be a secret shopper. They can they can meet face to face with your manager, district operational manager when needed, last minute. And so I, that was um, whether by chance or if that is part of the secret sauce to owning out of state. That was a really good thing. The other reason that I wanted to own out of state versus uh, where I am. I can't, there's no, no such thing as like having multiple units here in South Dakota where we live. Like most franchises don't work in my small town. And if I do, it's a it's an hour away and I could have a location of, you know, probably pretty much any franchise that I wanted, but then I'm limited to one location. So I like going into markets as a franchisee into to be able to grab a larger area, like in Solo Salon Studios, we bought the whole Orange County market. We developed 12 locations in five years. And what that did is it, it made that very attractive to a buyer because they could continue to develop in Orange County or, or other buyers, people wanted to get in Orange County. Maybe the, the Inland Empire uh, franchisee wanted to buy us out or the San Diego franchisee or uh, you know, the Arizona franchisee because they wanted to get into that market. So having an attractive market is really important it, because at Solo Salons, if we didn't have an attractive market like that, we wouldn't have been able, to, would not have been able to sell to private equity like we did. So that's a, I mean, that's that's for everybody and in getting into franchising. Like if there's ever an exit plan, you if you can be in a market that's attractive to one the franchise or or neighboring franchisees or a new franchisee in general. And, and it might even be a vacation spot. Some people buy franchises to go to Florida just to be able to have something in Tampa or St. Pete <laughs> or Orlando or whatever it is. So, you know, there's a, a little different strategy there as well, but a place that's attractive for people to be, whether it's personal or it's business. Mm, yeah, fascinating. <laughs> and what was that? I mean, what was that like? It sounds like you've done a lot of uh, partnerships with... Uh, with franchising and some people may be doing it on their own. They may be considering it, doing it with a, with a, with a partner, you know, what was that experience like for you? And do you have a preference in terms of partnership? Do it on your own now. I think I know what you're going to say, but, but for the, uh, but for the listeners and, you know, if someone is just kind of getting into it, do you think one is better than the other for them? I know all situations are different, but. I it's it's partnerships are hard. It adds another dynamic. And if you've never been in a partnership before, it might be really challenging for you. So if you can just do it on your own, there's reasons to go into partnerships. Maybe it's, they have a different skill set than you, or they're out of state, like we just said. Or maybe it, another reason that I got into partnership in Sola was because we were developing twelve of these things, and they were really expensive to start. So I, I needed the money and we started out with three partners. We brought on a fourth partner. So we didn't, so we would not be at a place where we were in need of money and we couldn't open up something. So that was access to capital was part of it. So we could open them up at the clip that the franchisor wanted us to. So that was another reason for a partnership. Um, so I, I like partnerships. 
But I also, uh, you know, most of the people that I've helped get into franchising over the years just did it themselves. And the partners that I had over the years were always in business for themselves and they, they own something themselves. And we got to know each other. We got to see how, how we were in business together. And those have been the most successful partnerships. We were franchisees together in a brand where it was just us. We got to see how they did in their business, their strengths, their weaknesses, their decision-making abilities, you know, how their employees uh, treat, how they treated employees, how their employees viewed them, all of those types of things. So we put together partnerships that were really strategic based on the things that the entity or the partnership needed. So lots of different reasons. I like partnerships now. Um, it's my preferred method. Uh, and I and I would actually rather be in the role of the investor now. And that's what I'm looking to do. So if I can put in 100% of the money or most of the money, let's say it's $100,000, I invest $100,000 into this service-based business. I have an operating partner that wants to run it. I loan the business $100,000. The business pays me back at the $100,000. And now we own the business I'll own a third of it and they own 70% of it. So that's the equity on the back end. The, they wouldn't have started it without me or they wanted me involved in it for different reasons, strategic value, but I get paid back my loan and then I have that equity kicker, 30% equity, 40% equity for the remainder of the business and they own the business. It's their business. I just have equity on the back end and I like things like that, but I'll always want voting rights in that particular scenario. Just because I don't own the majority doesn't mean I can get outvoted on everything. So I always want you know, the operating agreement not to reflect uh, a 30% uh, voting right. So, and, and just to be clear, I have not done this, but this is my preferred method moving forward. I've, I've gotten close to doing that, but I, this is the cleanest way for me to do partnerships moving forward. But it's more of an investor into an owner operator than it is a true partnership. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. Wow. So cool. And so give us a, give, give the listeners out there kind of a, a snapshot of, you know, uh, kind of what things look like from a business perspective for you now. So are you still a franchisee? Are you active in, in franchising? And, and uh, tell us a little bit about what you've got going on and, and uh, you know, where they can, can find you and get value from, from your content. So a lot of what I'm doing right now, I still own a brand uh, as a franchisee, but I'm very absentee with that one. I'll probably own other brands as a franchisee or investor, and I'll be very absentee in those. And going to be smaller, smaller things. They're not going to be big like Sola. Um, and then uh, really what I'm doing a lot now is helping franchisors or early, brand, early stage franchise brands, or maybe they're a, a bit older, but they are not selling as many franchises as they want. And over 20 years, that's a lot of what I've done. I probably helped a thousand people buy franchises over the years, whether it's as a, an area developer, a franchise consultant, or franchise development for different brands, or as a franchisor. So I've done all of those things. So I just have this really wide uh, experience in franchising that uh, a lot of people that are in the franchise world need need that to help grow their franchise brands. So that's really what I'm focused a lot on. I'm also working with, uh, so those are my private clients. They come to me, I just help them with their sales process. And a lot of them, their sales processes are just a disaster. Their, their sales process is set up to reward tire kickers, people that are never going to buy a franchise. So they're wasting a bunch of time with these people that are never going to buy all the while, these people that actually want to buy their franchise, they're not giving them the right information at the right time with the right expectations. And when they get to the end of the process, there's no real, a clearly defined, now it's time to buy. And there's no confidence in the franchise or that they know what they're doing. And when they say it's time to buy, the really good candidates go away because it hasn't been a real clear, concise, uh, proven franchise development process all the way through it. So I help brands like that, that aren't where they want to be in terms of bringing on new franchisees. 
Also, uh, what that's done is I've helped different brands and just my content out there, franchise ors are coming to me that want me to help them put together an area of rep or area development model. So I'm starting to help some franchise ors advise on how to put an area rep model, or even if it's the right brand to do an area rep model with. So I'm looking at doing that with a, with a handful of brands and doing it for advisory shares and equity. And then I have other brands that are just, they are at the beginning stages of franchising. Really cool brands. Some of them have big personalities behind them that have been on TV, that have been on different different uh, like industry shows on the Discovery Channel, but they don't know how to franchise their business. And so they're coming to me through my network and they're like, Eric, let's partner together and let's grow these franchise. Let's grow this as a franchise brand. So I'm helping advise some of them on that. It remains to be seen how involved I will be or not be because it goes back to, to this. Um, you know, I got into franchising initially to have a great lifestyle. When I sold uh, Liberty Tax, I was working the four-hour work week. I was living the four-hour work week and it was great. And I did that for, for a number of years. And then I started to get back into the hustle of things and building things like we were talking about early on. And then I started to get away from the four-hour work week, which is not about working four hours a week, but it's just kind of that, that mentality of just not trading time for, for dollars. And so I got away from the four-hour hour work week and started hustling more. And then I got back into having very lifestyle focused. And then I started when I started Mighty Dog Roofing um, with my two partners there, we really got into the grind. And that's one of the reasons I left Mighty Dog and I sold out uh, my, my shares to my partners is because it was going to be a lot of work. It was going to be too much work. And my family was going to start suffering because it takes a lot of work to do things right as a franchisor. And we were going to go from uh, that one brand and add on nine more brands in about five years to have a really big conglomerate of incredible service-based businesses. And as I was looking at that, it would have destroyed my family. And like, that's not why I got into franchising in the first place. So, um, so I took a, a buyout on that and it just left me in this place of being able to design my life again of how I want it to look. And it goes back to being around people that have that same uh, drive that I do to be a family man with a business, not a businessman with a family. And the more that I'm around people that think like that, that act like that, that are actually doing that, the easier it is for me to become that myself. Wow. I mean, I've got to say, I mean, I've got the chills. It's so profound. And, uh, and honestly, it's, it's inspiring into one. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't realize you had, um, you were out of, uh, of mighty dog. Um, but that is, I mean, what an amazing decision for you to make a decision based on your lifestyle with your, for your family, as opposed to with your wallet. Cause Mighty Dog's growing fast, like fast, oh, yeah. fast. Yeah, so incredible. like if you would have stuck around, I mean, you would have probably been printing money, really. Life-changing money, life-changing money. Here's the thing, like it would have been life-changing money. And as I thought about it, and they're, I mean, Mighty Dog's doing incredible. And, uh, and they're growing fast and they're doing more brands under horsepower brands. And so like, I love every minute that I spent doing that and, and helping to grow that, um, putting the infrastructure in place. And I mean, it's, and, and then they're just continuing, they'll just blow up. So a hundred percent, I would bet on that partnership all day long to have life-changing money. But then I started to think about what would change about my life if I had life-changing money, like what? As I look around about everything that I have, everything that I can do, what would I change about my life if I had, you know, a hundred million dollars in the bank tomorrow? And I would have a house on the coast, a house in the mountains, and that's it. But then I started to think about what is it going to cost me to have another house on the, you know, a, a, a second house on the beach, a, a third house in the mountains, what would that cost me? And I started to think about, like, I was already starting to miss, miss important things with the family. I was already, and so I'm like, this would cost me my family. And I thought, started to think about it. I have like well, eight summers left with my girls. And like, why would I waste five of these summers so I could have another house or two or three for the last three summers that I have with them? 
I'm like, it, it was, it, you know, so once I started to really think about that, it, it really became easy for me to do, even though it was hard. Don't get me wrong. It wasn't, it wasn't so easy, but, but it became easier. But here's the thing. You, you, are, you become like those who you're around. And I am putting myself around more and more people that have that same focus that I do. And if I'm around other people that are incredibly driven and they are sacrificing their family, I just take advice from them and I know how to filter it. And um, because there's going to be times when I want to hustle more and grow more, my family knows that. But at the end of the day, I want my family to look at me and be like, my dad took time to spend with me. My dad was there for me when I needed him. And it starts when they're really young. And so, uh, you know, so I am, they're, they're young right now. And they're not, you know, the oldest is 11. But when she's 13 or 14, and they all are in their teens, I want to have that relationship that is established today. So when we have those conversations, when they're getting mad at their mom for whatever reason, when they're teenagers, they can come to dad and we have that relationship. Like nothing will ever trump being able to have that with them. Wow. That's a mic drop, man. That's absolutely epic. Um, Eric, where, uh, where can everyone find you and, uh, and go follow you? Dude, uh, Franchise Secrets is my main website. That's where I have my podcast. You can get into a, a great Facebook group that I have there called Franchise Secrets. Um, and it's just a great community to get a lot of content. I kick out people that are trying to spam <laughs> spam people in there. People like you are in there providing helpful, helpful advice to people that are either buying a franchise or they are franchisees or they're franchise awards. So it's just a great community for that. But FranchiseSecrets.com is the best place to find me. Awesome, man. Well, I, I'm already looking forward to part two whenever, whenever that happens. Uh, it's been absolutely epic. And uh, thanks for the time, Eric. I love it. Thank you.